Children are our canaries. They're small. They have sensitive systems. They tell us what's going on in their environment. In this way, children are like the canaries in a coal mine. Coal miners used to take canaries in cages down into the mines. If the canary died, it meant there were toxic gases leaking into the mine. If the canary was singing, it meant the coal miners could stay, that they were safe. Children are our early warning system. Are we listening? What are they telling us? I used to be an attorney for kids in juvenile justice cases. And when I would go to dinner parties, people would say, what do you do? And I would say, I'm an attorney for kids who have been accused of juvenile delinquencies. And often people said, how could you do that? What if they're guilty? They would ask questions about some of the most horrible crimes they'd ever heard of. They would say, do you get kids off? And are you scared? Sometime later, I worked for the same exact organization, representing the same kids. But this time, their parents were accused of child abuse and neglect. And I would go to dinner parties, and people would say, what do you do? And I would say, I'm an attorney for kids in foster care. And people would say, oh my god, you're so incredible. They would act like I was Mother Teresa. They would say, wow, how do we do that to kids? That's so sad. Now I work for an organization that monitors conditions inside prisons. And we advocate for a more fair and just system. And I've been known to go to dinner parties. Now, I will say, this makes it sound like all I do is go to dinner parties. <laughs> Not true. I like to sit on my couch and watch Netflix and read the newspaper. But when I do go to dinner parties, people say, what do you do? And I tell them what I do, and I get really worked up because this is something I'm very passionate about. And sometimes I take out my phone, and I show them photos of kids in solitary confinement. Or I show them statistics about kids inside detention being restrained. This doesn't make me a very popular dinner party guest. We don't really like to talk about kids behind bars. And we don't really like to talk about childhood trauma. But it's a very important conversation. And it's one I want to have with you all right now. When children are in distress, they act out. When children have been traumatized, they sometimes break the law. The children in the justice system have many untreated needs, mental health needs, substance abuse needs. Most have experienced violence and trauma, often multiple kinds of violence and trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, hunger, domestic violence. When they act out, we should ask what is going on for them. We should ask what is happening in the mind. But we don't do that. We handcuff the canary. We are in the mine, and our children are not doing well. Some kids in the justice system don't really need help. Some have not been traumatized. Some are just doing stupid, foolish things that adolescents do. Adolescents often make bad choices. We know this. That's why we don't let kids vote or join the military. We don't allow them in some places to get a tattoo or a fake tan. But we often put them in the justice system, and in some instances give them criminal records for the rest of their lives for things they did at a time when their brain was still developing. When I was a teenager, I did many of the things that kids in the system do. I did graffiti. I trespassed. I smoked pot. I broke a lot of laws. My mom used to say to me, Gabrielle, you have to stop telling people when you speak about all the laws you broke. <laughs> Someday, she said, you may want to run for office. And the thing is, if I do run for office, I hope that you will still vote for me. <laughs> Even though, when I was in high school, I took magic markers, permanent markers, to high school, and I wrote really explicit and terrible graffiti in multiple places in my high school because I really liked someone, and they didn't like me. <laughs> they liked my best friend. And the thing is, I was caught, and what was my punishment? I had to clean the walls in front of all the other teachers, and all the other students. I had to scrub the walls. I, of course, maintained denial the whole time, even as I was scrubbing. In fact, I have maintained denial whenever this comes up until this moment. So if <laughs> my friends from high school are watching, it was me. But the thing that's really less funny is that years later, I represented a Latino boy in family court, and he was about 12, and he was being prosecuted for doing graffiti. 
And our money, our taxpayer money, went to paying the salary of the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorney and the court officers and went to holding up a system whose primary message to this boy and to his family was that there was something wrong with him. Our system is set up to tell kids that there is something wrong with them, that they are juvenile delinquents, that they are criminals. In America, 75% of the kids who are locked up are there for nonviolent offenses. We lock up Latino children at two times the rate that we lock up white children. We lock up black children at 4.6 times the rate of white children for the same offenses. It's not about who commits more crimes. It's about different punishments for different kids because of who they are. It's about how for some kids, like me, we let kids wash the walls. And for other kids, we prosecute them in a court system. Now, you might be thinking, you might be with me, and you might be like, Gabrielle, I'm totally with you about kids who do graffiti and kids who jump turnstiles or kids who smoke pot or maybe even commit vandalism. But what about kids who commit rape or murder? What about serious crimes? We need to teach kids to be accountable. We need to, we need to teach kids right from wrong. And those are good points. And many people think them, and you're right. We do need to teach kids to be accountable. We do need to teach kids right from wrong. But the way we're doing it isn't working. In fact, we tend to fail the kids who have committed the most serious crimes most of all. Every state in America prosecutes some children as adults. Kids who are prosecuted as adults can get criminal records for the rest of their lives. I heard a young woman who went through the system talk about this. She said it was like having a scarlet F on her chest, F for felon, for the rest of her life. Kids in adult jails and prisons are at grave risk of physical abuse, sexual abuse, suicide. But the juvenile justice system, which you're seeing photos of, these are photos of juvenile justice facilities all across the country, the juvenile justice system is often not much better. Sometimes it's just like an adult prison, but with smaller uniforms. On any given night in New York, there's approximately, excuse me, in, in the country, there's approximately 57,000 children sleeping in some kind of juvenile justice placement. These placements, that's a picture of Guantanamo next to a picture of the El Paso juvenile facility. Is this how we teach anyone that violence is wrong? Is this how we teach children to be accountable? Is this how we teach children how to change their lives, how to be better, how to treat other people? with dignity? The thing is, when we cheat children like this, what are we teaching them about themselves, about adults, about society? Imagine you were a child in those conditions. Imagine what would happen to you. I was in family court once, and I was in the hallway walking from my office, and I saw this girl, and she was about 12, and she was walking down the hallway. And I looked down at her feet, and she had these blue shoes on. They were dress pumps. They looked like her best shoes. I imagine thinking they were her church shoes. They had low heels, and they were a little bit scuffed. And the other thing is she had chains around her feet, and she had chains around her wrists, and she had a belt around her waist, and her hands were chained to the belt around her waist. And she was shuffling down the hall. And I don't know why she was there, but I can't imagine anything she did in which that was a good punishment, or in which that taught her a lesson, or in which that would help her grow up to be a better citizen. The other thing that we do is we put children in solitary confinement. We lock them up for 23 hours a day with no access to other human beings. We put their food through a slot in the door. We don't let them go to school. If a parent did that, we would remove their child from the home. We would remove all children from the home, and we would lock the parent up. We would say that is child abuse. And you know what? The newspapers would go crazy. And the newspapers would say, how did the child welfare agency not know? How could anyone have let this happen? Didn't anyone see? Didn't the neighbors see? How did someone lock their child up 
in conditions like that, and no one did anything. But it's happening right now. Our government is doing it right now as we sit here. And now that we all know, what are we going to do about that? When I worked in family court, I would often stand in the back of the courtroom and I would wait for my cases to be called. And I would see as the court officers brought these kids in. And I saw, I saw many times, I saw when the court officers took the handcuffs off kids, the kids who were almost all boys, they were almost all black and Latino boys. And I would watch the officers unlock the handcuffs and then I would watch and the kids would stay like this the whole time often while their whole case was pending, they stood like this, even when the handcuffs were off. And I thought to myself, as I ask you now, what are we doing? What are we doing when we make handcuffs invisible? When we teach an entire generation of children to handcuff themselves? What are we teaching children about themselves? And what can we do instead? Hope, said Emily Dickinson, is the thing with feathers. It perches in the soul. Because see, the other thing about the canary is that when it was singing, the miners knew that they were safe. I've been doing this work for about a decade, and I've always been very passionate about it. But something changed for me recently. What changed is this. In the past year, I lost both of my parents, about six months from one another. And about four months before they got ill, I was on a meditation retreat. I'm a new meditation student. And I was doing silent meditation. I was doing a walk. And what that means, if you've never done it, you basically just walk in silence back and forth. And so we were in this hall where we were walking, doing our meditation, and there was this statue at one end of the hall. It was this wooden statue. She was very beautiful. She was about two feet tall, and she had this crack down the middle of her. It looked like her heart was split open. And what happens if you're spending a lot of time in silence, this was many days, is sometimes small things take on great significance. So you read the same sign over and over again, or you begin communing with a wooden statue. And that's what happened to me. I began commuting with Our Lady of the Lightning, as I began to call her, because it looked to me like she'd been split open by lightning. And every time I walked by, I would stop and I would look at her and I would think, I want to be more like her. And then, by that summer, both my parents were gravely ill. And I felt like she looked, like my heart was cracked open. And I thought, I wish I didn't ask to be like her. And then a few things changed, three actually. The first thing that changed is this. I began to feel the suffering of the world more. When you've had that kind of pain, it is harder to ignore the pain of others. And the second thing that, ha that changed is this. I got a lot of help. I got help from people skilled at working with grief and trauma. I got help from other people who had been through similar things. And I learned that pain and trauma with help, with support, with skill, can be transmuted into healing. And the third thing that happened is this. I realized that the only power the power we humans have, we each have, to do that, to mind pain and turn it into healing, is love. Love has the power of alchemy. Before he died, my dad was in hospice, and he knew he was going to die. And a bunch of us were sitting around his bed, and he talked to us about what he'd learned in this lifetime. And this is what he said. He said, as you get older, you talk about love a lot. And it sounds trite, but it is not. What I have come to see is that love is the most important thing. Love is the only thing. At its core, it is about love. Without love, we are nothing. And sometime later, I began to wonder, what if we took that force, the force of love? And what if we applied it to our children? But not just our children, not just the children in our family, but all our children. Even the ones we are most afraid of. Even the ones we don't know. And I want to pause now, and I want to ask you to think for a moment about a child or children 
that you love most in the world and really hold them for a minute in your mind's eye and think about if that child had broken the law, if they did something wrong, or if they were simply accused of breaking the law. What would you want society to do? How would you want them to be treated? And can you still love them? And for another moment, I want you to still hold that child in your mind. And I want you to think about what if they were hurt? What if another child harmed them? What would you want society to do? What kind of response would you want there to be? And then here, this is the hard thing, and it's really hard, but we've done a lot of hard things. We've gone to the moon. We've created the internet. We can do this too. I want you to imagine a justice system that works for both the child who was harmed and the child who did the harming. Because here's the other thing that I don't always say at dinner parties. They're the same kids. The kids who cause harm and the kids who have been harmed are the same. When kids have untreated trauma, they cause trauma. And the way to heal a society is to heal its children. We are all ordinary beings capable of great love. We are all bodhisattvas of compassion. A just justice system is possible. It never looks like a child in chains. It never looks like child abuse. It is never a child in solitary confinement. But it is possible. Ask yourself, what does just justice look like? Ask yourself, what role can you play? And then take up the call. Thank you.